Okay, so it's a great pleasure today to have Zheng Wei Lu speaking from Tsinghua University. He was a, a student of Vaughan's at Vanderbilt, and after that, postdoc with Arthur Jaffe, whom we're pleased also to have in the audience today. And so Zheng Wei is going to speak on quantum Fourier analysis in memory of Vaughan Jones. So Zheng Wei, please. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank David for the invitation. And today I'm going to talk about this uh, new subject, which we call the quantum free analysis. And this is highly inspired by the subfactor theory uh, developed by Wong Jones and his group. And uh, in this talk, uh, I won't give the full details. Instead, I will talk about the general idea in quantum free analysis, its motivation, and some selected results and perspectives. And quantum Fourier analysis combines electric Fourier transform and sometimes pictorial in the case of subfactor theory with analytic estimates. And this provides very interesting tools to investigate phenomenon such as quantum symmetry. So uh, for further references, we refer the readers to the recent joint work with Arthur Jeffrey, Chun Lan Jiang, Yun Xiang Ren, and Jin Song Wu. And the paper is now published at Peanuts in 2019. And uh, first, I will review some terminology from classical free analysis on groups. And then we will go to the quantum case. The Fourier analysis has a long history. It was introduced by Fourier in early 1800s, 1800s. And his original motivation is to solve differential equations describing heat. And the key point is the Fourier transform will give a dual equation and that transform the differential equation to some polynomial equation, which is much easier to solve. And the Fourier transform has the following integration integration form, and from the integration form, actually, it's easier to analyze some p norms on functions, and therefore, to get some certain bounds and inequalities. And there are some very important algebraic uh, operation related to the Fourier transform. One is the usual multiplication of functions, and the other is the convolution of functions based on the multiplication of group elements. So we know that the classical Fourier transform intertwines the convolution and the multiplication. And this kind of Fourier duality not only works on the real lines, but also in the very general framework, like locally compact abelian groups studied by Pankriakin. And Tanaka Crane introduced the Fourier duality for compact groups and their representations. And that leads to a categorical understanding of the Fourier duality. So from this in integration form, we can actually give some quick estimates. So first, we define the p-norm of the functions in the usual way, based on this higher measure of the real lines. And uh, first we have this equality, the Fourier transform is a unitary transformation on L2 space. So the two norm of the function F is equal to the two norm of its Fourier transform. And we can also derive some other bonds between P norm and Q norm. such that P inverse plus Q inverse equals to one. And this is a very classical con condition appeared for many inequalities. Somehow this is a kind of duality between the two LP space. And this inequality comes from the interpolation of the previous inequality at two norm and the infinity norm. And there's another inequality related to the free transform and that's the Young's inequality. 
if you take the conversion of two functions and then it's R norm, it's bounded by the P norm of the first function and the Q norm of, Q norm of the second function. Well, even though we don't see the free transform directly in this formula, but somehow you can see, okay, on this space of functions, we have two operations. One is convolution and the other is multiplication. And somehow we want to study the relation of norms, like P norms for two different operations. We consider this kind of a more general version of Fourier analysis. And those inequalities has a sharper bounds given by Beckner in 1975. So we can improve the coefficients from one to those products of A defined in this way and subject to the above conditions. And the key point is that when f is Gaussian function, then the best constants is obtained. And actually, that is somehow an if and only if condition. So we can actually solve the inverse problem and the extreme measures are given by certain Gaussian functions. And this is also a very general phenomenon for free analysis. Gaussian function plays a key role describing the extreme measures of various inequalities. And from those inequalities, we can actually also describe other measurements like the entropy. So here is the a very useful entropy. It's called the Shannon entropy for the commutative case and called phonema entropy for the non-commutative case. So you can take this function f and take its absolute value square and then take the integration for t log t for this functional calculus. And then we get the Shannon entropy. And then we will have an uncertainty principle. We take f and compute its entropy and then take the free transform of f and compute its entropy. Then their sum has a lower bound. And I have already conjectured the lower bound is, could be better as log e over two. And that's also proved by Bechner as a consequence of the previous inequality, the sharper Hausdorffian inequality. And for this inequality, for the sharper one, there's another quick proof by Tufidis in 1975. And the, another key point is, as mentioned, the extreme measures of those inequalities are Gaussian functions. And this inequality actually is stronger than the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle, saying the position and the momentum cannot be measured precisely. So mathematically, we can compute their standard der der derivation, and then the multiplication has a lower bound. So this Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be easily derived from the entropic uncertainty principle. Well, the entropic one actually also has a physics in interpretation. So those are some classical inequality in free analysis, and the Gaussian function plays a key role and it behaves as extreme measures. There are many other inequalities like that, but uh, we'll just mention those elementary ones, but somehow very representative uh, inequalities. Now we are going to the, to the next topic, the quantum symmetries. So we are going to discuss the free analysis for quantum symmetries, which we call quantum free analysis. So first let's discuss various quantum symmetries. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on the quantum symmetry that's in my favor called subfactors. And this is a topic initiated in operating algebra but has wide connections. And there are actually other type of quantum symmetries closely related to subfactors. And they can have infinite dimensional like Cassie algebra locally compact to quantum groups or some topological type of examples like subfactor plane algebras or surface algebras or higher dimensional topological quantum field theory. And to have analysis, we need the unitary condition, namely the corresponding vector space is Hilbert space so that we can have a measure. And also uh, which can, those can be formulated in the categorical language. 
So we can study the unit diffusion category or modular categories or two categories. And also there are other motivations to study those quantum symmetries appeared in quantum information. So those inequalities actually also apply to multiple qubits on tensor networks or lattice models in many body systems. But in this talk, we will mainly talk about the inequality on subfactors. But actually most inequalities we discussed on subfactors also works in other frameworks. So subfactor theory has those wide connections in mathematics and physics, such as operator algebras, quantum groups, representation theory, knot theory, lower dimensional topology, category theory, statistical physics, quantum field theory, etc. And the key point is that uh, one has established a lot of connections with this root subfactor theory. And now we are going to work on the quantum free analysis for this type of quantum symmetry on subfactor theory. And then based on the previous connection, we can actually transform the quantum free analysis on subfactor theory to all those three related subjects. So actually in that way, we can derive a lot of interesting analytic properties in other subjects as well. And actually, if you look at those related topics, they do have analysis like operator algebra, but somehow infinite dimensional analysis, like functional analysis, and they have other algebraic perspectives, topological perspectives, and also some very interesting connections in physics. But somehow the analytic the aspects like free analysis or harmonic analysis is missing in those connections. So we are, some, we are trying to explore those additional connections to this very wide well connected area. And one, we know one win the field medal at, as, uh, 1990 for his work on subfactor theory and which leads to the discovery of the Jones polynomial. Now I'm trying to follow his philosophy to extend those connections. So what is a subfactor? First, uh, we need to introduce what is a factor. And it's a phonema algebra with trivial center. And it's of Type two one means the factor is infinite dimensional and it has a trace. So this trace plays the role of a measurement, but somehow a non-commutative version of measurement is a tracial state. And there is a very interesting factor that's called a hyperfinite factor. It can be constructed as an inductive limit of finite dimensional phoneme algebra. Like for example, infinite, infinite tensor product of two by two matrices. And one can obtain a factor by taking the GNS construction or from the trees, the tracial state. And this half finite two one factor is very interesting since somehow it's unique, namely it's independent of the choice of this inductive limit. It's also universal for finite symmetries. So the very interesting question is, okay, this high finite two one factor is so universal for finite symmetries. However, it doesn't detect the difference between the finite symmetry, but it's quite big, it covers so many. So there should be a way to recover those finite symmetries. So how to do that? How to remember the finite symmetry in high finite two one factor? And the answer is subfactor. So by definition, a subfactor is an inclusion of factors. Like we have two factors, N and M. And the remarkable result of Jones is the classification of the Jones index, namely the size of the subfactor, or we can consider M as a N module, and then we count its dimension. Then this value is classified by this discrete series and this continuous family. And those values are called the Jones index. So how do we remember the group symmetry from the subfactor or other symmetry? So here's an example. You, take, you can take this hyperfinite factor and you take a group action on a hyperfinite factor. And then the cost product give you a bigger factor. And this embedding is a subfactor. So this embedding, the subfactor remembers the group. And the more interesting part is 
it's not only remembers the group, but also it remembers the representation theory of the group. So namely the free due. And moreover, the GOC index of this special subfactor is the order of the group. So that's generalized the size of the group. But it has a big difference since the order of the group is always a natural number. But here we see in general, the GOC index may not be a natural number. So in that sense, somehow it's quantized. And we can consider the, sum, the sub factor as a factor R inside the action of a quantum group on R. And actually there are examples coming from quantum groups. But in general, we can consider the sub factor as a kind of a, action of a quantum group acting on high quantum factor. And in a recent talk of Sorin Popa at Harvard, he called it a virtual lambda group and lambda is the Jung's index. That's also pretty good terminology. And from the sub factor, what do we have? So one has a, a very beautiful construction. He can run the base, so-called basic construction and get not only one sub factor, but a tower called Jung's tower. So get, he gets a sequence of factors and one embedded in the other. So many sub factors. And for each neighborhood, each nearby pair, you get a sub factor and they have the same Jones index. And a very interesting phenomenon is that this sequence has a Z2 periodicity. Namely, the sub factor N in M is isomorphic to sub factor M1, M, M2. So this is a Z2 duality between N in M and M in M1. And we will consider this duality as a free duality. So why is it a free duality? Well, if we take the so-called higher relative competence, take competent of N and competent of I, M, then we have this big lattice of commuting squares. And this, this is called the standard invariant of subfactors. And for the case when the subfactor is a group comes from groups cross product, then there are two special pieces, N competent in M1 and M competent in M2. The two algebra, one is the functions on groups and one is the group algebra. Somehow it tells the representations of the group. So in this way from sub factor, we can recover the groups and its representations. And actually we can put both in a bigger algebra here is the cross product of the group and its due. So this becomes a very interesting property to study the structure of groups. And actually it provides additional tools to study group theory. Now, there's another formulation. If we focus on the two special space here, the orange one, if we focus on two special space, then we don't need the full power of this machine, we can look at the space in another way using so-called by modules. So given this subfactor, since n is smaller, then we can consider the left and the right action of n on m. So m is an n by module. And then we can construct an algebra as the home space of the n by modules, m. And this forms a C star algebra A corresponding to the Orange, uh, orange part, n competent in M1. And we call this algebra A. And the interesting part is M as a bimodule, but M itself is a factor. So it has a multiplication. And that multiplication induced another multiplication on this home space. And that's actually the convolution, the convolution map. So from the convolution, we can actually construct another C style algebra, which we call the algebra B. So that corresponds to the other, another orange piece here. A is L infinity G and B is L G. Now, if we take this example, the cross uh, group cross product sub factor, okay, the A is L infinity G and B is L G. And the convolution on the A algebra coincides with the classical convolution on functions of G. So this gives a framework from subfactor theory 
that recovers the usual algebraic structure we started on groups. And actually, they, it ha also has a pictorial interpretation in terms of plane algebras, which is also similar to the diagrammatic notation in category theory. So we consider the bimodules as uh, objects and the bimodule maps as morphisms. And then this M as an N bimodule, we can further decompose that as N M bimodule and M N bimodule. So when we consider the home space, we will have two bounded points on top and two bounded points at the bottom. So exactly in this home space, it's represented by a square-like picture. Now, why I emphasize the structure of this picture? Because for such a picture, for such a square, there are two ways to compose squares. One is horizontal and one is vertical. And for this vertical multiplication, this will be the usual multiplication in the home space. And that corresponding to the multiplication in the algebra A. And a very interesting fact is, if we take the horizontal glue in map, that gives another multiplication, and that's the convolution on A. And actually, we can further extend the 2D picture to a 3D space to define the multiplication and convolution as a surface tangle. So it's on a surface and with input disk and output disk. So the picture are pretty similar, but one is 2D, one is 3D. And the 3D picture has further advantage, which we will mention at the end of the talk. But now let's focus on 2D picture. So now we have multiplication and convolution. So a very important part is the Fourier transform, the major topic in this talk. The Fourier transform is a 90 degree rotation. And pictorially, we can easily see, okay, this Fourier transform intertwines the multiplication and the convolution. That's a key feature related to those algebraic structure. And now it has a pictorial interpretation. And another very interesting fact is this pictorial definition is crucial in our proof of certain inequalities in quantum free analysis. So not only this gives us a very good intuition to understand the free transform, but also this pictorial definition is important in the proof. It gives new mathematical tools to prove mathematical inequalities. And that's a very important part we want to emphasize. So topological structure could give us new analytic tools. And actually the other side is also true. Analysis is also important to understand topology. And we will see some examples soon. And another interesting fact is here we consider the square-like picture, but if we go to this standard environment, we go to the higher relative competent, like n prime in mn in bigger space, then we will have a diagram with two n boundary points. We can still take this diagrammatic rotation by a stream we call the stream Fourier transform. Then the periodicity will become two n. For the classical one, the periodicity is four. But for the general one, the periodicity could be different. And actually, this general free transform also has interesting free analysis. And that's beyond the scope of classical, somehow quantum analog of classical free analysis. It's something pretty new. But again, in this talk, I won't go to that direction. I will focus on this 90 degree rotation. So now the second question is, we already have very good free duality on some factors. It has algebraic formulation and topological formulation. And actually it can be transformed to other kind of free duality in different framework. For example, the very important modular transformation as matrix for modular, tens uh, for modular tens category could also be understood as this 90 degree rotation in sub factor theory. So now the question is, do we have free analysis or quantum analog of free analysis on the subfactors? And the answer is yes. And this is our original motivation to develop such a subject. Now we call quantum free analysis. 
let's see which kind of results we have. So uh, in recent papers with uh, several collaborators, Chunlan Jiang, Jin Song Wu, Asa Jaffe, Pingxiang Ren, and Sebastian Paco, and actually many others, uh, we have a long list of inequalities coming from classical free analysis. And we have their quantum version. And some of them actually, even for the statement, for the formalism, becomes highly non-trivial. And some of them for the proofs become highly non-trivial. And not only we have those inequalities, like the Hausdorff inequality we mentioned, the Young's inequality, and different types of uncertainty principle. But also we have the characterization of the extremizers that attain the equality. And those characterizations are very important, not only in classical case, like classical free analysis, which give you a Gaussian function, but they are also important in the quantum case. And other than that, we also have some new results like the 2D-dimensional 2D analog of the central limit theorem. And this is even new for Z2 group. Now here I will give one example about those uh, inequalities. So first from subfactor, we have a Fourier transform and we have two algebra, A algebra and B algebra. And the Fourier transform maps from A to B. Now, first we want to estimate the norm of the Fourier transform for different P and Q. So we take the P norm of X and the Q norm of its Fourier transform and we want to estimate this upper bounds, k. And then this is given by the following diagram. So p and q are positive real numbers. And then we will see this fifth figure. The right line is the condition for Hausdorffian inequality, namely p inverse plus q inverse equals to one. But there are other two special blue lines. And then here you see three different regions. In a single region, the value k is given by this function with base mu. And mu is the Jones index. And from one region to another region, you somehow you see a phase transition when they go across the line. And this figure actually appeared in classical free analysis already. And here we have the quantum analog. And the very interesting part is for this quantum analog, this index mu could be a non-integer value. Like for groups, it's always an integer. But for subfactors, this doesn't have to be an integer. So it's really a quantum phenomenon. And another interesting fact is we can characterize the extreme measures of those inequality. And on the left side, we take the different regions. We have nine different regions. And on the right side, the extreme measures are given by different algebraic properties on operators. And here, I will highlight one of them corresponding to the Hausdorffian inequality. The extreme measures are given by the so-called by shifts of by projections. And this is a quantum analog of Gaussian functions for subfactors. And here, the by projection comes from some intermediate subfactors in the work of Dietmar Bisch in 1994, there's a, actually a one-to-one -one correspondence. And for the group case, they correspond to subgroups for finite group case. And shift means translation or modulation. And for the group case, that means cosets. Now, if we combine those operations together, the cosets for the group side, for both A side and B side, we have two different, two di uh, two different directional shifts, that's why we call it by shifts. But this definition becomes highly non-trivial. And finally, we can characterize the extreme measures in this way, and actually many inequalities appeared in quantum free analysis are described by such extreme measures. This is similar to the extreme measures described by Gaussian function for the real case. And from this inequality, so once we know the norm of the Fourier transform for arbitrary positive P and Q, we can take the derivative. And from that, we can get entropic uncertainty principle. 
And here, we can first get the Renyi entropy uncertainty principle. The Renyi entropy is defined by the following formula. And if you, if you take the limit when P equals to two, the Renyi entropy becomes the phoneme entropy. So this is a general, generalization of the phoneme entropy. And then we have the following uncertainty principle. We can compute the Renyi entropy for X in A and the Renyi entropy for its Fourier transform in B. And then their sum has a lower bound. So in this formula, uh, we have a weight between the sum and actually the weight can be modified. And all the inequalities are sharp and the extreme measures are obtained at by shapes of by projections. So in particular, we can modify the weights to be one. And this is a, a entropic uncertainty principle for Rayleigh entropy. And since many interesting entropies like minimal entropy, maximum entropy, phoneme entropy, there are all different kinds of limits of Rayleigh entropy. So we can recover those entropic uncertainty principle from this Rayleigh entropy uncertainty principle. So this is somehow a very general one. So for example, if you take the limit of P inverse and Q inverse to be one half, then we can recover the quantum version of the hirschman beckner uncertainty principle. So the entropy here becomes the phoneme entropy. And the sum of the phoneme entropy of X and its the entropy of its Fourier transform has a lower bound. And actually here, I would say the lower bound in a different way. There is an interesting factor two, a, na a more natural way to say the factor two is not really two times this formula, but we replace X by the free transform of, of X. And then we take sum of two terms. But since the free transform preserves the two norm, then when we take the two norm square of the free transform of X, we end, up, we end up with the same formula. And that's why we get a factor two. But the formula can be written down in a more symmetric way. And we believe there is even a more general formula than that. But so far, we don't have a, a proof of such kind of generalization. And once again, the equality of those uncertainty principles holds if I know if X is a by shift and of a by projection. So while we are interested in those uh, inequalities, actually my original motivation is not really proving inequalities on subfactors. I was working on a classification of subfactors and won't give me a question. Actually, that's the first question won't give me. Uh, that's the classification of so-called exchange relation planar algebras. And then when I work on that, I, I had a very long tedious proof at the beginning. It's about like 40 pages algebra computation. It's really like messed up and won't ask me to simplify those computations. And eventually I saw, okay, if we can use some analytic estimates, those algebra computation could be simplified quite a lot. And actually we can get even more general and stronger results. And that's my original, my original motivation to use those free analysis machine in subfactor theory. And actually using those methods, we can reduce the 40 page proof to much shorter one, less than 10 page. So it's pretty powerful in that sense. So I will mention those applications in subfactor theory and category theory. And there are actually other applications in quantum information. For example, the uncertainty principle we mentioned above could be transformed to the uncertainty principle for entanglement entropy in quantum information. And in this way, we can get several different new uncertainty principles. But in this talk, I will mainly focus on the results related to subfactor theory. So first, when I try to work on those classification of subfactors, I need to characterize intermediate subfactors since that will simplify the classification quite a lot. And the methods in quantum free analysis led to various characterizations of intermediate subfactors or by projections in planar algebra. In particular, we have some quite interesting re results just in terms of subfactors. Here is one of them. 
if we take a subfactor, you reduce the subfactor finite index, then in M, and we take Q to be an intermediate algebra. So Q doesn't have to be a star algebra. It's just an algebra. It's closed under multiplication. And then the conclusion is Q is automatically a star algebra and it's an intermediate subfactor. So this is somehow a magic that's based on this finite index and irreducible condition. We don't need the star condition. We only need to take an algebra closed under multiplication and then it's the multi it's automatically a star algebra. And this proof so far is it relies heavily on the methods in quantum free analysis. And I could I could not find any direct proof in terms of operator algebras. And actually, both conditions are necessary. If we remove the irreducible condition, then okay, say for the reducible case, we can have a factor n, say the hyperfinite, and the hyper factor m given by hyperfinite times of its two by two matrix. And then we can take an intermediate algebra using the upper triangular subalgebra. And then this is not closed under the joint operation. And if we remove, if we keep the irreducible condition, but we remove the finite index condition, the so infinite index, then we can take the cross product construction from the group Z. And then from the, we can get an intermediate algebra by looking at the cross product by the semi group C plus. And then in that way, we get an intermediate algebra, but it's not a style algebra. So somehow it's the magic when we combine both conditions, finite index and the irreducible condition, then the star come out. And there's another result about the classification, which is one of my favorite, uh, favorite classification results on subfactors. So, uh, if you take the subfactor and subject to certain ability condition, such as the algebra A and B, we might we mentioned above are ability, and then with one extra ability condition, formally said uh, set the three box space modular the basic construction ideal is ability. Then we can say this subfactor is a free product of finite ability groups and the tempered leap just subfactor finite algebra. So I have to interpret the theorem in the following way. So what's the free product? In the non-commutative setting, the free product is a minimal product. And this is introduced, was introduced by Bisham Jones in their invention paper. And abelian groups is the simplest abelian examples and tempered leap Jones plane algebra is the simplest subfactor. They corresponding to those subfactor with small index in Jones original classification. So we have minimal product of simplest example in this classification. And this is an if and only if condition. And this is quite similar to the classification of finite abelian groups. That's called the fundamental theorem of finite, finite abelian groups. And here we, we have a quantum analog of that. We replace the product by the free product. And we replace a cyclic group, the simplest example by finite abelian groups and temporary leap Jones plane algebras. And the assumption are just abelian conditions. And also this is first the classification for subfactors without bounds on Jones index not dimensions. So in subfactor theory, there are two major classification programs. One is based on the bound of Jones index. Another is based on the bound on dimensions. And actually when I work on this paper, Ron suggest me to work on the classification by skin theory. And that means we don't take any can, like bounds on Jones index, not the dimensions. And in this, somehow this result is a full classification of what I call the commute relation planar algebra. So it's a skin theoretical classification result. And somehow it's a third classification program for subfactors. And uh, using the quantum free analysis methods, 
we not only have this classification result, actually, we also have other classifications, like the small, for the small index classification, we can classify irreducible subfactor planar tours with Jones index less than six. And this is trying to work with Morris and Penis. And the key point is again, based on those conditions, we can show as the subfactor has intermediate subfactor or it's easily removed out. And once it has intermediate subfactor, then, then the Jones index has to be a product. And for that case, we have another classification. And uh, we also have a skin theoretical classification for the exchange relation and the A algebra is four dimensional. And if you count the generator, it's called doubly generated exchange relation plan algebra. And this is exactly the original question won't give me at the very beginning. And also we can derive another classification result with the same dimension of A, but uh, we have a bound from a three, dimension, uh, three box space. And also we can have uh, the singular generated classification result uh, initiated by Bisham Jones. And in, in our joint work, we can extend the dimension to 14. And those classification also has a uh, further result, but I, I do not mention here. Now, uh, there's another interesting perspective in group theory, namely the lattice of subgroups. And that's actually a very important topic. And here for subfactors, we can consider similar concepts. We can discuss those intermediate subfactors and they also form a lattice. So as we mentioned, the intermediate subfactors corresponding to back projections, and those are extreme measures for those inequalities in quantum free analysis. So in that way, we can say, okay, maybe the analytic methods are helpful to study the lattice of intermediate subfactors as well. And actually the answer is yes. In early days, in 1996, Watatani proved that the size of the lattice is finite. And then Longo gave a better bounds in terms of the Jones index mu. So it's mu squared to the mu squared. And then in the same paper in 2003, Longo conjectured that the bounds can be improved to mu to the mu, this better bound. And then using the analytical methods, we can give the bounds nine to the mu. So we not only uh, proved the conjecture of Longo, but also we improve the bounds as this exp exponential function. Another interesting result I would like to mention is from Sebastian Palco. Uh, he proved that if the lattice is distributive, then the subfactor plan algebra is cyclic, namely it's gener generated by a single minimal projection. And this is a quantum analog of all theorem for finite Hubbardian groups. Say if the lattice of the finite Hubbardian group is distributive, then it's a cyclic group. And this is a quantum analog of that. And actually, this quantum analog is already non-trivial for group subgroups in group series. It already leads new in, in uh, sorry, it already leads to, leads to new results and actually non-trivial results in group theory. But when I work on this subject, we got those inequalities uh, in, uh, around 2015 and uh, won't ask what are the applications of those inequalities on subfactor to other areas? And actually, uh, that's one direction I focus for a while. I'm looking for some other applications beyond subfactor theory. And then uh, when I talk with Zheng Han Wang, he actually gave a very interesting question. Whether our inequality can be obstructions of categorification since there are many fusion rings that people are studying and they are trying to categorize those fusion rings and get interesting fusion categories or modular types of categories. And there's still many fusion rings. People, people have the rings, but we don't know whether they can be categorized or not. And then when I give a talk at MIT, Pavel gave another interesting question saying, okay, 
how we inherit works on some factors and I explained uh, those results on some factors and I actually give new inequalities on fusion categories using the quantum double construction. And then we get inequalities on Gerson decrees. And then Pi will ask, okay, why the, the inequalities on Gerson decree just holds on the fusion rings? Then that means we don't really need categorification. We don't need the categorical structure to prove the inequalities. But in our proof, uh, we have the impression that the, at least for the non commutative condition, the categorical condition is essential. We cannot remove that. So we thought those inequalities are non trivial. And what is more surprising is okay, we actually have a very good answer to all the three questions and a very surprising result. Now let's see what happened. So there is an inequality. The statement is very simple saying, okay, if we take two positive operators in A and then we take their convolution, the convolution is also positive, which I call the quantum short product theorem. The so white short product theorem, there is a very a basic result in metrics, in by metrics. If you take two positive metrics and then you take the pointwise product, that we can consider as a convolution, and there is still a positive matrix. And that theorem, theorem is called the short product theorem. And actually, in some practical case, in the spin model, uh, this result covers that theorem. And there's, not, there's another way to think about this result. You can take two functions on groups, two positive functions on groups, and then you take the convolution, it's still positive. So those two are somehow the very simple case, but the general case is actually highly non trivial. So here, uh, in our recent paper, we apply this theorem to the dream field center of a unitary fusion category. Then we obtain inequality, the following inequality. Here, I, for simplification, I write down the statement for the commutative case. So if the fusion category has a commutative fusion ring or Gerson decree, and with the character table lambda ij, then we have the following inequality. And this sum has to be positive. And this positive really comes from positivity in the quantum short product theory. And the very interesting part is the following. In this inequality, we never use the categorical structure like the F symbols. Only in the proof, we use that. But in the statement, we do not need that. In a statement, we only need the fusion ring, which determines the character table. And in general, we check that this inequality may not hold on the fusion ring. So that means this is a distinction, it's an analytic obstruction of unitary categorification of fusion rings. And we are actually very ex exciting at the point. We get a new analytic obstruction. But at the beginning, actually, we are lack of example. We don't know which example it will apply to. So we want one example at least. And not only this analytic obstruction, we also have other inequality, like the quantum analog of Young's inequality. It's also analytic obstruction. So actually, we have more analytic obstructions. But somehow, this inequality is the simplest one to check. So we take this one, we discuss this one. And then I talk with Sebastian, my collaborator, and he has a fusion ring by hand, rank seven fusion ring. And this is very important fusion ring since it's simple, namely it has no non-trivial subring, and it's integral, namely the, the dimension of the simple object or the proof of this dimension are integers. And it's a very important question to know why the such kind of simple integral fusion ring has a categorification if they are not group-like. Now he has uh, he, he actually had asked many experts whether this can be categorified, and then he had checked all known criterions, but there's no way to eliminate this fusion ring. And then okay, I explained to him our new methods. This true product criteria. And then let's see, how do we check that? We write down the character table. It's a diagonalization of the fusion ring. So we can do this by computer easily. And then we run this sum. So here we take the last column. You see it's 
becomes cubed. So we take all the three lambda i to be the last column. And this, this very simple sum. And now the value is negative. Now then by the previous theorem, if this fusion can be categorified, this has to be positive. So now we know it has no categorification. And this is the first example we run. And then after that, we had the classification of simple integral uh, fusion ring subject to the following dimension. You, you can see it's pretty big actually. We get this dimension by supercomputer and we found 34 examples in this list. Four of them are group-like. And it's very surprising to us that 80, sorry, 28 out of the other 30 can be eliminated by the single short product criterion. So we can eliminate it 93 percentage by this analytic obstruction. This is really surprisingly efficient. And also it's very easy to check by computer since essentially we only need a diagonalization of the fusion mean. Now here are the, uh, uh, we, feel we found very interesting applications uh, of the inequalities. And actually we mentioned some inequality from classical free analysis, but there are large families of other inequalities, not that classical, and actually they're very deep. They're called the best company leap inequality. So the modern philosophy is somehow we don't, we not only want to study inequality one by one, but we want to study inequalities in families. And the breast can believe in inequality is such kind of inequality. They should find the inequalities parameterized by linear transformations. We have those linear transformation bj from Rn to Rmj. And then we can take functions fj on Rn, on Rnj and then take pullback by the action of bj, and then take the multiplication of the functions and take the integration. And then the breast can believe in inequality said, okay, this integration is bounded. Okay, we take the absolute value. It's bounded by a best constant and then times the product of the p norm of those functions. And those p, those parameter p satisfy this condition, this extra condition. The sum of nj over pj is n. Okay. This inequality is really very general. It includes many classical inequalities. For example, the Janssen inequality, the Hurd inequality, Loomis V inequality, they are all special cases of this inequality. And once again, another important fact about this inequality is actually it's a deep result. The best constant C is obtained at certain Gaussian functions. So this share this key properties we mentioned at the very beginning. And actually it depends heavily on the convexity of certain geometric structures. Now we want to say, okay, we have such a big family of inequalities. Do we have some kind of quantum analog of the inequality? And this is a question proposed by Chung Ha Xu. And one example here, we already understand it's the Janssen inequality. And here we can take three special linear transformations. And then by running the breast camper leap, the inequality is equivalent to the Janssen inequality. The very interesting part is all the three maps have meanings in plane algebra. And actually all the three maps, B1, B2, B3, they are not linear transformations on Rn. In plane algebra, those maps become planar tangles. And this is a very important point. That means we shall consider those linear transformations in breast complete inequalities as planar tangles in subtract the planar algebra. And then actually, if we take the corresponding planar tangle, we run this machine, then eventually we do get the quantum Janssen inequality in our case. There's no insurance for that, but we check the computation, it just works. It's a magic. And in general, there is a problem since 
we need to take a transformation from Rn to Rnj. And somehow this means Rn can be considered as the tensor product of n copies of R. So it has n input and nj output. If you take a do, then nj input and n, n output. But in plane algebra for the plane tangle, we have we can have multiple inputs, but only one output. So here we need to extend the plane tangle to what I call the surface tangle. And that can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. It's kind of a topological quantum field theory. You can have cobordisms. And the inputs are circles, and outputs are also circles, and they live on the boundary of a surface. Well, here for the surface, we can have additional defect lines in the surface, like additional data. And those data plays the role corresponding to non trivial linear transformations in breast campy lib inequalities. And then we can reformulate this inequality just by replacing the linear transformation by surface tangle. In surface outwards. And then we can write down inequality. And we can ask a similar question, what's the best constant for C and whether they are obtained at certain by shifts of by projections? Well, there is still one point missing in the formula in the formalism. Here, the sum, sum over nj, so, sorry, sum of nj over pj equals n. So what's the meaning of this inequality? What's the meaning of nj? Here we have the pj in the formula, but what's the meaning of nj? We no longer have linear transformations. Instead, we have surface tangles. That means we need to give a topological interpretation of those nj in this equality, like p inverse plus q inverse equals to one. This appeared in analysis. Now we need to give a topological interpretation of this identity to formalize the topological breast company leap. Well, here is the answer. We can describe this identity using the topological properties of the surface tangles. And the very interesting part is in sub factor, we have two colors, N and M, corresponding to two different types of colors for the region. And then by different choice, we have two choices to write down the identity. And both of them give the same identity, and actually these two are equivalent, and the proof of the equivalence is exactly Euler's formula in topology. So this is a good indication that inequality does have connections with topology. And I think that's the future we want to explore. We want to explore what happened in the inequality, what's the topological aspects of inequalities. And on the other side, how to apply those inequalities to the structure of surface tangles or tensor networks or other kind of diagrams. And there may be further applications in the study of quantum information or machine learnings. Well, thank you. <laughs>